All right, boys and girls, thank you for joining us once again for round two with researcher slash medical student Kevin Bass, where we were talking last time about all sorts of different ideas around human nutrition, uh, human nutritional requirements. We got into the weeds a bit with some ethics ideas and things like that. Um, but we thought it was worth continuing on. So, Kevin, how's it been for the week? What's been happening? Uh, we keep finding good stuff in the lab where I'm at. We're actually, uh, we may be, we may be showing that, um, at least for mice, it may not be the case for humans, but at least for mice, the colon may play a really important role for, uh, the, the regulation of blood ketone bodies during fasting. Okay. So, so the, the, um, Conversion from butyrate to beta hydroxybutyrate may be quite substantial in the mouse colon and cecum. So, as you may know, uh, the mice have a cecum, which is kind of a, fer a fermentation chamber that humans don't have. We have an appendix, which is uh, paltry compared to the mouse cecum. So, the findings may not necessarily translate to humans. There's some indication in some of the literature that fiber may drive some some degree of ketogenesis in humans, but uh, still unclear and it's not, not been shown in mouse yet mice yet and we may be showing that i don't know we're 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 uh finalizing some of the experiments and we're getting good data so that's that's where my life is right now really just trying to finish this phd and not um but at the same time not like become unbalanced just doing phd all the time and neglecting other things other goals i have as well so it's kind of a kind of hectic and very busy busy life situation i have but not bad not bad, not bad. All right. What about you there? <laughs> yeah, it's been pretty frantic. It's a never-ending treadmill as a YouTube influencer because basically until you hit a certain critical mass, you've got to drive the thing by posting at least once a day, um, multiple times a day even with different formats of uh, videos of different links and different things. I'm actually also – the proud uh, owner, if you like, of five different channels, four of which are being completely neglected because one is actually more than full-time work. A um, bunch of consultancy clients on the side as well. And I'm also involved in marketing a nutraceutical product uh, designed to increase the release of CD34 plus adult stem cells to the bloodstream. And um, so all of those things combined keep me Pretty pretty well out of trouble, or pretty well in it, depending on how you look at things, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> so, a kind of a recap, at least from my point of view, and feel free to make any uh, adjustments to this summary. But last time, um, we started out by you saying that you're leaning towards a plant based diet as being optimal. For humans, you're open to other ideas. Um, I asked you a bit about what it was that underpinned that. And you seem to be saying that what seems to be underpinning it for you is your ideas around ethics rather than anything actually scientific. Was that correct? or? Um, partly. So my personal choice... Uh, because I want to be honest, like I think a lot of times when you talk to plant-based influencers or people who are into plant-based diets or vegan diets, often they'll start touting the health benefits. But uh, most of the time, that's not the real reason they got into the plant-based diet. Or sometimes it is, but then they also have other motivations and they can be quite unclear. And Talking about the science in terms of the health benefits uh, is a way to talk about things without necessarily getting into the sticky issues of ethics, which drives a lot of people. It's kind of dishonest, in my opinion. They use a, a kind of distorted understanding of science in order to push um, essentially their ethical point of view onto other people uh, in a kind of sneaky way. And I really dislike that. So I wanted to come out and be honest about like where. I had originally come to, to a lot of this from originally um, from the perspective of, of ethics. That said, let me see if I can get this right, because I don't want to be 
Like, I don't want to be too, too shallow. So that said, I do think that, um, there are, there are reasons uh, based on a certain interpretation of the scientific literature, which I think you completely disagree with and, and actually think is pseudoscience, but um, there are reasons based on a, one interpretation of the scientific literature or a few for thinking that plant-based diets might also be quite healthful. Uh, first of all, I think we both agreed that a plant-based diet, especially maybe a whole foods plant-based diet is probably better in the standard American diet, because the standard American diet is abysmal. Yes, agree. And um, so, so there's that, um, which I think is is an important point because even if, again, we can I can take a devil's advocate position. Even if a plant based diet is not optimal, let's say something more of a, a hyper carnivorous diet is is optimal. Mm -hmm. um, even if that would be the case, it would still be an improvement to move more people onto a whole food plant-based diet. Now that said, um, or a more whole food plant-based sort of oriented diet, dominant diet. That said, a lot of the plant-based uh, the world is actually moving people in terms into kind of more of a plant-based, but not a whole foods plant-based diet, which actually probably isn't much of an improvement on the standard American diet. I don't think it's an improvement to be, you know, replacing burgers, beef burgers beyond burgers, beyond burgers, burgers like, at, all. at all. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, um, yeah, so, so pragmatically, but okay. But, but that said, like, let me, let me make sure I, I say this the right way and don't like go off into a, um, yeah. So from that point of view, if we can improve dietary quality by, uh, replacing, um, you know, components of the standard American diet, especially on healthful components of the standard American diet with more whole foods, plant-based components, I think we can make an overall improvement on population health, whether or not another diet might be more optimal. We can, you know, once we get to the better place, we can think about that too. So from a health point of view, I do think um, it's hard for me to see how, um, how it wouldn't be better if people consumed a more a whole food plant-based diet, again, just people not eating meat anymore is not going to help anybody. It may actually hurt. And the data actually, I think, are quite clear on this point that that uh, if you watch the Game Changers, for example, a lot of the food that they promoted in that, that movie was, um, and of course, I'm sure you hate that documentary and a lot of your viewers do, and I don't like it either. Uh, a lot of that food was like junky food. If you, do, if you eat in that way, yeah, it's not going to help. But if, if we replace with whole foods, We'll make an improvement. So, from the health point of view, I can't see the significant downside in becoming more whole foods predominant. Maybe not even necessarily focusing on making it, you know, vegan, but like replacing a lot of low quality Western diet foods with whole foods. I can't see that being a negative. I think it's only a positive. And from an environmental perspective, again, we talked about the land use problem. Assuming we continue to have a large population, then we're going to have serious land use issues. So from an ethical point of view, and I think we probably both agree on the ethics, I think most normal people agree on the ethics about at least at least as far as, um, you know, not torturing animals inside factory farms. I think most people tend to agree that that's a good idea. Mm. Uh, and then from a health point of view, I think there's a pragmatic argument to be made, even sidestepping the whole idea of what's optimal. And then from an environmental point of view, an environmental point of view, I think, is not the original reason I got into the plant-based diet. But now that I'm oriented in that direction and have been looking at the data, actually, whenever I first started thinking about plant-based diets, I really believed in the ideas of like Alan Savory, the regenerative agriculture people. Uh, and I kind of had a contradiction there because I wasn't sure how to square those two. Uh, and I even thought that it was maybe okay to have, you know, people who are like paleo, who, who advocated eating a lot of beef, et cetera, because from a regenerative perspective, it was like a good idea so that supplement like a plant-based diet and that'd be perfectly fine. But now the more I'm into it, like the more I'm, I've been reading the research um, and learning about the debates about regenerative agriculture and Alan Savory's ideas, I don't even see how we're going to get, um, you know, large scale uh, farming of, of, uh, of beef 
that's going to allow people around the world to be eating a hyper carnivorous diet because of the land use problem. So from a land use perspective, again, I think it actually, and it's not something I want to say because it's not something I like from a certain point of view. Like, I don't like the idea of because there's so many people on the planet, um, you have to have more people eating a plant-based diet. And like, there's just this hard constraint seems like, seems like we're, 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 we are kind of having a symptomatic uh, approach to a, a core fundamental problem that really, like, we shouldn't be dealing with this overpopulation problem. But since we do have an overpopulation problem, I don't see how we're going to get around, um, like, using the land better. Because I don't think regenerative agriculture, the promises of regenerative agriculture are, are true. So I, I just think we need to reduce the amount of uh, land that we dedicate, especially to beef farming. Chicken and pork is another issue. So from those three perspectives, again, I started out in the ethics. Uh, I think from a pragmatic point of view from health and from an environmental point of view, like we just have this land use constraint. I tend to lean towards more plant-based diets without necessarily being vegan. And I think that that uh, that's why I advocate for plant-based diets, which is why I think that they're, quote, unquote, the future. But I'm I'm uh, I'm curious to, to hear what you think. Okay, um, several threads in there, of course, as there always is. Let's start with the health issue first and foremost, because that is my primary concern. As I said last week to you, while we can talk about ethics backwards and forwards until the cows come home, ethics is not a hard science. And it's very difficult to empirically establish anything from that side of things. However, in terms of health, so let's start there. Yes, I absolutely agree with you that a vegan diet or a more plant-based diet is superior to the standard Western or standard American diet for about three to five years. That's the caveat. Thereafter, what you generally find is that there is a vast, precipitous, and disastrous um, disintegration of the health of most people who try to consume a diet which does not contain any animal product at all. I'm talking about vegans. The numbers are reported variously by various organizations and people that have done such things. So people can go and check me on this if they want to. But basically, the, the anecdotal register, if you like, is that 84% of everyone who ever decides to eat a plant-based diet without animal products quits that diet and starts eating meat again. They do that within five years. And 90% of those people cite the reason for quitting was catastrophic health failure born of nutrient deficiency. So yes, you're right. It is superior to a standard Western diet, short term. Long term, it absolutely is not. It's far worse. And those people's health will fall to bits precipitously, quickly, vastly and hugely on average. Whereas the standard Western diet will kill somebody over 30, 40, 50 years. Sometimes a bit longer than that. So to suggest that a plant-based diet is superior for long-term health in human beings is false, Kevin. That will not hold any water. That will not wash. There is no data to support that claim extant anywhere in the literature. That is an ideology. So we can dismiss that completely out of hand as empirical scientists, because we both are empirical scientists. We both have experience in designing and undertaking empirical science investigations. So we both know the importance of supporting claims with empirical data where it exists. And unfortunately, the claim that a vegan diet or a plant-based diet is superior even to the standard Western diet beyond about five years is false. So that's the end of that one. Um, in terms of the practicalities of land use, if we stopped using the amount of land that we currently use for monocrop agriculture entirely, and we allow those lands to return to their native format, 
the native multi-culture format, that will provide perfectly sufficient space to ranch as many large ruminant animals as is required, in fact, for the humans on this planet, even at the current overpopulation. And I don't disagree with you about overpopulation. However, that is an opinion that you and I share. That is not a fact. It's an idea. It's an opinion to say there are too many people on the planet. And as I say, I agree with you. I think there are. However, to suggest that we cannot feed ourselves sustainably with beef is also false, demonstrably false. There is enough land on planet Earth that is arable and usable to rear large ruminant animals. Absolutely. I also agree with you that animals should not be kept in the conditions that many animals are kept in, in the factory farming lots. I, I do believe the treatment animals receive there is poor, and I would like to see it improved, absolutely. However, that also being said, I will not sit here and let any vegan, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting you're doing this, Kevin, I'm just saying this is where I'm coming from, I will not sit there or here, or anywhere, and let any vegan tell me that they are in an ethically superior position to I am on the basis of how their diet is involved in the treatment of animals. Sorry, no way. Absolutely unacceptable. Vegan diets kill orders of magnitude higher amounts of animals than any carnivorous diet. Again, absolutely demonstrable fact. So that's not going to wash either with me. Um, so that leaves me, I guess, again, pushing you, Kevin, for any kind of supportable scientific argument that would support any, what you're calling a whole foods diet. Plants are not food, Kevin. Plants are not food for human beings. I'm sorry. Um, you, you could call it a whole plants diet. You can also call it a whole foods diet if you want to, but that's false because plants are not food for human beings. So let's, let's if we can, I'll see if I can push you once more for anything that would support a diet based on plants as being remotely sufficient for a human being, let alone even potentially optimal um, or superior ethically. Yeah, so from, um, I think we we already agree on the, the ethics point about the, the number of deaths of, of, um, of all sorts of animals whenever we do monocrop agriculture and probably many kinds of agriculture and displacement of habitats, et cetera, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any disagreement about that. I'm not a vegan, so just um, just... For your viewers and for yourself, I'm not, I don't take the view that, uh, that one should not ever take life, that taking life is always inexcusable and, and there's no reason for it. Mm -hmm. I think you, you end up in all sorts of preposterous places when you take that position, as you may know, again, from your encounters with Avi Bitterman and from my own encounters with Avi Bitterman, I think, I think the, uh, logical uh, implications of that are quite unacceptable, at least for me. Mm. So, um, but I do think comparing a conventional agricultural system, conventional meat to, um, to, to say mono, mono, uh, monoculture, monocrop agriculture, um, maybe more lives are lost, but at least, uh, you know, at least, you know, at least uh, with monocrop agriculture, animals aren't being confined and essentially tormented for their entire lives until they're brought to slaughter. So that's mm. so if we if we juxtapose those two now, your argument was that uh, we're not necessarily going to use conventional industrial agriculture to raise these animals for the entire planet. We're going to use, uh, say, some sort of uh, grass fed system. Or, or, or tradi more traditional system, mm. maybe integrated, integrating the manure with fields and the old, old way that it used to be done before, you know, Haber Bosch and, uh, and artificial fertilizers, herbicides, et cetera. Mm. 
So yeah, that, um, so again, we run into, um, and again, there's several different threads and I don't want to just end it here. I'll, I'll, I'll address all of it, but for this thread, it, we'd still run into land use issues as far as I've been able to tell. So there's this one paper, uh, it's called, is the grass always greener? Comparing the environmental impact of conventional natural and grass fed beef production systems. Mm -hmm. Now this is a, uh, this is grass fed and I don't know what they find as natural, but let's just, I don't know what they think is natural. It's somewhere in, intermediate and conventional and, and uh, grass fed in terms of the environmental impacts. But they compare, they compare the, these three different systems in this paper in terms of the land use, in terms of the water use, et cetera, et cetera. And I understand that these are averages and there's probably all sorts of assumptions that are underlie these that neither of us are probably well qualified to immediately mm -hmm. Um, yeah. see, but as, as far as I can tell from this paper, um, for every, uh, 10 to the nine kilograms of beef, I guess that's like, what is that a billion? Yeah. That's a billion kilograms of beef. Yeah. Um, you need, according to this paper to, get it, you need, <laughs> you need, uh, for grass fed. Right for grass fed, you need about ten thousand times ten to the three hectares. So that would be what ten million hectares of land. And I'm not going to go into all the calculations. I can show this to you, or we can. It depends on what you want to do. But mm -hmm. just to summarize what I like looked up, and I did this a couple of years ago because I was interested. Hey, like let's let's like take this to its logical conclusion and see if we could actually feed the population in this way. So if you wanted yeah. to give all Americans one kilogram of beef every day, which is 2,500 calories, mm -hmm. uh, you'd need enough, you'd need uh, the arable land mass of uh, 5.14 United States is. So that's the arable, as according to these figures. Now, again, you may have different figures, but according to these figures that I found, you'd need this much land mass to support that much beef for every American. Now we could say maybe we do three fifths of that, 60% or 50% of that. I'm not sure, but you need a lot of land mass to support a really high beef intake for all Americans. I think right now Americans take, I want to say less than a hundred grams of beef per day. I may be wrong about that, but it's not, it's not a lot. Mm. And we consume more beef probably, I think than most other, uh, most other populations in the world. So if you want to dramatically increase that, according to, you know, uh, conventional or, or, or legacy ways of raising beef, cap, beef cattle, then you're going to need a lot of arable land. That would be the one point that I would make there. The, the second point, I would, the last point really, and, um, well, and we were actually, and I also want to remind you of another point you made during part one of this discussion, because I thought it was interesting. I wanted to hear more, mm -hmm. but um, you made the point about nutrient deficiencies. I'm not necessarily advocating for a vegan diet. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't consume a vegan diet. I feel terrible on a vegan diet. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never been able to maintain a vegan diet. I just don't feel mentally right on it. And of course, me saying that in the vegan community always would get me in trouble. You never really were a oh. vegan and you did it wrong. Right. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Like if you don't feel good, you're doing, you're doing it wrong. Right. There's nothing wrong with a vegan diet. It can't go wrong. Mm. It's like, they think it's like the perfect diet. Mm. Um, which is, which is like kind of the definition of an ideology. That's like what people who have an ideology do. Like there's yeah. nothing that's wrong with the ideology. If something goes wrong with the ideology, it's like the person who did it is wrong. There's yeah. something wrong with that person. Yeah. You can find that like in every ideology, it's always yes. that way. Yeah. People who like disagreed with um, the Soviet ideology <laughs> during the uh, USSR years, they would like literally be thought of as insane. They would be mm. put in mental hospitals because you, how can you disagree with this? Uh, there must be something wrong with you. Yeah. Um, the ideology is not the problem. So I, I don't agree with that. I think I, I, uh, I don't know what the prevalence of people doing poorly on a vegan diet is. I, I agree with your statistics. I know that those statistics are correct because I've looked into it. Um, 
a, a really large proportion of people who do report negative health outcomes or or not feeling well or or, or switching back to a non vegan diet for for health reasons. Uh, and then if you look at the observational data, uh, like if you survey people about the nutrient intakes, like vegans are tend to be deficient in a, a range of different nutrients from iron to vitamin A, and it depends on actually how you find deficiency because we actually yeah. don't have really good uh, yeah. nutrition science on what constitutes deficiency at this yeah, point. It's exactly. a lot of it's guesswork. Yeah. But vegans definitely do come up really short on a lot of nutrient. Protein's also a big one as well. Yeah. Um, and then if you look at long-term vegetarian and, and vegan eaters, you also see that they tend to have lower lean, lean mass. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of really good studies about this. There's some cross-sectional studies that have documented this. And I, I completely believe it. Like they tend to be thinner, like uh, maybe a few BMI points lower, but then they also tend to be quite thin. I don't know if you know any like long-term like sort of animal loving vegans who are not like really thin. Like most of the ones that I know are really thin as far as like their muscles concerned, they're not muscle yeah. muscular yeah. people. And I think the protein intake probably accounts for some of that. Yeah. So I think there's a whole range of issues that undermine thriving or can undermine thriving on vegan diets. And I, and I'm not necessarily advocating for a vegan diet. The, the, the thing that I'm advocating for is a more plant predominant diet maybe especially with respect to beef and uh and uh if there are nutrient deficiency issues um then uh we can we can fortify some of those away um it's not like a again it's kind of a symptomatic approach it's not the kind of thing that i like to i don't want to see the world where people are eating fortified foods in order to get their nutrition it's not the kind of like nutritional landscape I would like to see because I would like to see people eating healthy and making quote unquote the right decisions. That would be my personal preference, but it's like not really up to my personal preference. Like whatever is going to help people is going to help people. And um, so, yeah, that, that's sort of my position there. You did mention something last time and I was really interested in hearing your perspective about this. Uh, I know, we're, I know again, we're like on like three or four different threads, but you mentioned that it's not just necessarily a nutrient deficiency issue, but also a uh, maybe an excess issue. So humans shouldn't be consuming so much fiber. Um, we don't Any have at all, in fact. Milk. No fiber is indicated. Zero. No fiber. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So then also maybe uh, carbohydrate content, no more than 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. Mm -hmm. So those points would be interesting to hear you about. Now, now, now it, 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 it sounds like, and I just want to like be clear about this because um, for people who are just tuning in or just people who are my long-term followers who are curious about like the directions I'm going in, because this is kind of different than what I've done before in the past, but I just want to like let people know and also you as well, Art, um, that uh, yeah, like um, yeah, I'm not really interested in debating. Um, I'm kind of just interested in hearing your mm. views on things because, um, it's not so much about whether I'm right or wrong. And, and my opinion is not whether you're right or wrong, but for me, the reason I'm doing this is because we can sort of clearly give the audience, uh, an understanding of like where the positions are and yes. they can make their own choices. So, yes. um, yeah. So that's excellent. That's okay. Good. So let's, let's deal with those threads. Um, the first thread is circling back to the land use issue. And you're quite right. Neither one of us, Kevin, is remotely qualified to comment on that. Neither one of us is an environmental scientist. Neither one of us has done any significant work in that area. I would happily read the paper that you were talking about there. And I bet you anything you like that within a few minutes, as a well-experienced empirical scientist, I will be able to poke about half a dozen holes in the thing. I think it's wrong, but that is just my opinion. So we can leave that there. At the end of the day, whether or not there is sufficient arable land on the planet or the ability to create sufficient arable land by changing land use around to feed us on an entirely, for example, beef-based diet, that's actually neither here nor there. That has no impact 
whatsoever on what is physiologically indicated for a human being. What is the optimal diet? Ethics play no role in it. Environmental concerns play no role in it. It is what it is, whether I like it or not, or whether you like it or not. And that's kind of where you led me to with your with your final point there and saying you'd like to hear about why I'm saying those things. Well, in terms of the fibre issue, there is, to my knowledge, one and only one even remotely well-controlled pseudo-clinical study on enteric function in human beings as that relates to the intake of fibre. There are hundreds and hundreds of articles that talk about fibre and talk about the gut microbiome and fibre and healthy microbiome and healthy fibre intake and associative studies linking the intake of fibre with so-called lowered incidences of various disease processes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there is only one experimental study that I'm aware of that's been done. It was a small-scale study, and it was short-term, so they are two limitations of the study. It was N equals 64, I believe. And what they did was they recruited 64 individuals, all of whom had idiopathic constipation, bleeding, piles, issues, hemorrhoids. Um, shut up, GoPro. Who asked you? Goodness me. Um, you know, real, real dysfunction issues, real serious dysfunction issues. And what they did is they split the cohort into X number of sub-cohorts and had a stepwise reduction in the fibre intake isocalorically and controlled as many of the other things that could have played into it as they could possibly achieve. And don't quote me, but I think it was short term. I think it was like two weeks or something like that. So a really short term study, absolutely. But the people who had increased fibre above baseline on that in that constipation cohort, all of the people in that sub-cohort got worse symptomatically on every score. The people who maintained the same fibre intake, the control group, if you like, had no change in their constipation, bowel function, etc. Well, what a shock. Change nothing, nothing changes. Okay. The people that reduced their fibre intake by X percent, I think it was 25% or something, or 50%, I don't know, can't remember. They had a commensurate reduction in their symptomatic presentation, commensurate with the amount of fiber that was removed from their diet. And the final group of people in that study consumed no fiber whatsoever. Every single one of those people had complete remission of every symptom, every one of them. Fiber seems to be, from that one study, associated with vastly poorer enteric function. Now, you yourself last week, when we spoke last week, put yourself in that category as well as someone who has an individual tolerance level for fiber, which if you go over that, you're going to have a problem with your bowel function. Um, so it's, it's a well-known thing, actually, when you look at the actual outcomes that people have in bowel function as that relates to fiber. More fiber means more problems with your bowel function, more constipation, more anal bleeding, more piles, more chronic systemic inflammation, more C-reactive protein, more problems of every kind leading from that, all the sequelae involved in all of that, more pain, more suffering, more discomfort, all of it. Okay, so that's fiber. The associative studies that say the intake of fiber is associated with lower incidence of various cancers and things, it's just that, it's associative, it's not cause and effect, it's not well controlled, it's not science, it's just rubbish. The differential statistics are so close to zero as makes no odds in any case, actually for any one given living human being over a 100 year lifespan. And those results are adjusted, in other words, fabricated. It's ideology, it's bought and paid for, it's nonsense, basically. Um, so there's that. In terms of the carbohydrate issue, it's really simple. All you need to do is go and look up the Randall cycle, and that will tell you why you should not consume a diet which is mixed macronutrients, fats, and carbohydrates. You should consume a diet which is rich 
and one of those, and poor or absent of the other one. And then the only thing left to do to decide which one of those diets you should pick is look at which one of those diets is associated with vast destitution of a nutrient required for human beings and health failure. Job's done. We are hypercarnivores. That's also supported by the nitrogen and carbon isotope testing we spoke about last time. That's how we have developed, absolutely, those other genes that are unequivocally selected for. Um, pretty much, it's, it's a really easy decision. In order to make a good decision about what is good nutrition-wise for a human being, what you have to do is look at the hard sciences around that topic and none of those will be found within the ring-fenced area of ideology known as human nutrition studies. There is no science in there. There are no experiments done in there. You can't experiment on human beings. Okay. You can't, you can't get ethics um, for that. And in, terms of, in terms of hard health outcomes, mm. you cannot subject human beings to a risk of this or risk of that situation, experimentally, ethically, you can't do that. You will not get ethics to do that. Ergo, yeah. human nutrition studies is a reductionist area of crack pottery, pseudoscience, bottom right-hand corners, funding sources, bastardization, the almighty dollar, uh, propaganda, smoke and mirrors. So we have to look at the hard sciences. We look at comparative anatomy and physiology. We look at the organ systems that we've got. We look at our metabolic pathways. We understand things like the Randall cycle. Very, very important. Job's done. Now we understand what the human being should consume. We go forth and we do that. And we enjoy rude health and longevity. Or at least there's no evidence of anything contrary to that or antithetical to that. So, is it, can I respond now? Mm. Please, yeah. So, last time we talked, um, trying to figure out. Um, last time we talked, we talked about how the we started with the isotope studies, if I recall correctly, mm. and um, we we talked about how for have isotope studies for the last hundred thousand years or so. Mm -hmm. There's some question, or at least I pose the question. Perhaps there's no question. I'm not sure how the field is situated, but mm. I pose the question whether uh, there could have been substantial amount of plant intake that mm. was apart from the meat intake that was low in protein, so that you didn't show up in the nitrogen isotope mm. uh, data. Uh, you suggested that um, that that wouldn't be the case because there weren't there wasn't a lot of availability of plants uh, that were edible that were of that type in those areas during that period of human evolution. Mm -hmm. I asked, "What about before one hundred thousand years?" Then, and you said. Um, it seems reasonable to extrapolate those nitrogen isotope data out to before uh, that 100,000 years because those are all the data that we have and we can assume that human beings have been eating roughly the same um, for that period as well, mm. if, I, if I remember your argument correctly. Yeah. Um, and then I said, what about the last you know, 10 or 10,000 years or so? What about rapid evolution with a growing population yeah. or environmental pressure? And um, and you you said that perhaps there could have been some recent evolution as well, but it, you know, it's been most most of that evolutionary period has been um, characterized by the Paleolithic. The Neolithic is relatively recent, but yeah. still, there's an open question in my opinion about at least as far as the evolutionary history. We could talk about the anatomy, maybe maybe um, well, we could talk about that. But uh, as far as the evolutionary history is concerned, it's not 100% clear to me that, uh, that we are perfectly well adapted to a hypercarnivorous diet. Um, we may have developed some, uh, I don't know what you think about this. Mm. We may have developed some tolerance or some 
um, de adaptation towards a more meat based diet with with a heavier grain diet. So maybe some of those adaptations might be mutually exclusive. I know that with the development of APOE2, I think the ancestral gene for APOE is APOE4. There's Max Lugavere, is a friend of mine. He was on he was on uh, the Joe Rogan show recently to talk mm. about this. Okay. Um, with agriculture, we developed APOE2. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily correlates to meat eating or to uh, grain eating, but there may be some genes that if they adapt us better to agriculture might kind of de-adapt us from those ancestral metabolic sure. pathways. So, so I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering it, and, and let me make a really good example here, or at least I think it's a good example. You may not, but what do you think about the uh, amylase copy number increases? Do you think that that's a legitimate uh, finding? Do you have problems with those studies? Do you think that uh, agriculture Whole populations have seen increases in amylase. I know that the, the the biological relevance or the biological importance of those increased copy numbers is unclear because once you do actually some studies, you the the effect on glucose and mm. glucose disposal is actually not what people would expect yes. as far as I've read the studies. Yeah. But um but yeah, like do you think that there's some evolution in that direction? And if there is, then it seems plausible perhaps that um even from your point of view uh it seems plausible perhaps that that humans uh could consume grains and i want to actually just put one more piece of data in there there's if you look at the um the plaques the teeth of of old skeletons you can see pretty much universally uh some grain starch residues uh, uh uh tuber residues actually mostly i think grains and legumes um, now you can say that we didn't consume that much of them, but I think what those plaque data, if you, assuming you accept those data, there's, uh, these calcified plaques and then they find the, they look at under the microscope and they can identify, um, based on like the residue shape, the way the crystals formed, whether or not they're starch residues. Now, I don't know what you think about that. If you think, mm-hmm. that's, you know, but if assuming those two facts, recent evolution, but also some exposure over the past hundred thousand years or two hundred thousand years or, or yeah. for a long time, yeah. some exposure to grains and legumes, whether or not um, you know there is some adaptation in that direction, mm-hmm. and uh, and I guess maybe maybe the, the interesting question to be to ask, you say I guess the maximum amount is is fifty grams, fifty grams of carbohydrate based yeah. on the Randall cycle. Okay. Yeah. There, there's a lot to talk. There's a lot to bite off there. And I'll just like leave you with that. And we'll, I guess we'll keep going based on what you say. So. All right. Okay. So as I said last week, yes, I agree that when you place any organism in a given lifestyle, it will start to adapt to that lifestyle and the genetics of any species does move forward glacially over time, but not steadily. There there are stepwise precipitous changes in various physiological capacities and the expression of various different genes and different proteins. For example, the amylase one that you that you spoke about there. Throughout our history as a species, which we believe to be around about three hundred and fifty thousand years. Humans have had to generate the vast majority of the glucose that we require to live on a daily basis ourselves. We've had to generate that metabolically ourselves from non-glucose precursors, mostly the glycerol backbones of triacylglyceride molecules. There are one or two uh, gluconeogenic amino acids as well. And furthermore, we can also use monocarboxylates like lactate for example, to build up sugar through gluconeogenic process, the Cori cycle, as the case may be. That makes perfect evolutionary sense that on the very rare occasions as we evolved and developed as a species that we actually could get our hands on a reasonable bolus of carbohydrate in one whack, that it would behoove us to be able to absorb and take advantage of that to save us from 
the process of gluconeogenesis, which is reasonably metabolically um, inefficient, if you like, much like many human metabolic systems, vastly inefficient, to be fair. So there is no negative effect throughout our 350,000 year span on being able to absorb rapidly break down starch in our mouths to glucose and absorb that quickly because it didn't happen very often. About eight to 12,000 years ago, depending where you live on the planet or where your genes come from on the planet, I should say, humans suddenly started to grow crops of grass to eat the seeds of that grass, grains. Yeah. And suddenly we were smashing down relatively massive doses of carbohydrates. Associated with that in the archaeological record is the sudden development of a lot of chronic degenerative diseases, bone problems, dental problems, uh, the evidence of certain cancers and in in, certainly in the bones that are remaining in, in these archaeological digs, etc., 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 a reduction in stature, average height, a reduction in the robustness of the of the skeletons, which indicates a reduction in the robustness of their skeletal muscle mass, etc., 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 etc. All of these things, it seems to have been a bit of a problem for us. The argument that remains to us here, really, however, is this. Let's say there are three broad categories of diet that you could undertake as a human being. You could undertake a diet which is entirely plant-based, no animal materials at all. You could undertake a diet that is a mixture of plants and animal materials, an omnivorous diet, the one that most people have been told is optimal, the one that most people follow the standard diet, and there are various different levels of health of that as well because you could eat a pretty pure, pretty clean, omnivorous diet without consuming hugely processed foods or the chemical shitstorms that are available and all that. You could eat off the land. You could eat beef and homegrown vegetables and you know that kind of stuff, absolutely. Or you can eat a junk food diet. Fine. The third kind of diet that's possible on the other end of the spectrum is one that is based entirely on the flesh and associated fat of animals, mostly ruminants, mostly grass fed, if you please. So, what we can then do, given that there is no evidence that we can go to here, there are no experiments existing on human beings where they were locked in labs at birth, treated in a certain way, in both labs identically, genetically identical twins, that is, large numbers of those for statistical power over multiple decades under control and observation. So we go to the anecdotes, and we look at those three classes of diet, and we go, who enjoys the rudest, most robust health of those three dietary patterns And who suffers? Who struggles? So let's take the vast majority of people first. Let's take the omnivores. Let's take the standard dieters. Now, what we're being told is that the problem here is processed foods. Take the processed foods out and the problem is vastly ameliorated, which may be correct. However, nonetheless, what we've got in that population, if you go and have a look at any record of public health statistics over the last hundred years or so in any westernized nation anywhere in the world and you will find an absolute horror story. You will find a vast increase in obesity. You will find a vast increase in uh, cancers, heart disease, dementia, all the big killers, basically. Um, That is clearly not the right approach for human beings, the mixed macronutrient diet. Even the people who stay away from processed food seem to be overrepresented in terms of what would be expected to be a natural prevalence of disease process at a given age. So that diet seems to be counting itself out as the best idea. 
let's look at the plant-based diet. Okay, in the first three to five years, it's better than the standard diet because it alleviates the Randall cycle problem slash issue. And as such, it reduces chronic systemic inflammation and that leads people to believe that they're more healthy, they're doing better, it's a great diet. As I say, for about three to five years, and then the nutrient deficiencies of that diet kick in and those people's health fall to bits. On average, there are very few people who genuinely last any amount of time beyond about five years as a vegan. They are the exception and not the rule. So let's put a big red cross through that diet as well. That only leaves one, Kevin. And there is absolutely no evidence extant anywhere that people who eat a carnivorous diet have worse health outcomes than either of the other two populations. In fact, it seems like the one and only one anecdotal study that's available at this time, and it's the Harvard study on carnivores, 2060, N equals 2060, carnivores of six months or more. Ridiculous, it's not science. But that study indicates that it's all tickety-boo. And there's no evidence to suggest it's not tickety-boo for any reason. So for me, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Anyone who wants to say a carnivorous diet is bad for us is making a positive claim, and it is them who is responsible to find evidence that that is so. Every attempt that has been made so far has proven to be vacuous, false, ideological, pseudoscientific, or even anti-scientific in nature. There is not one single indicator that a carnivorous diet is not indicated for human beings. So that's where I sit. So there's um, there's a lot of there's a lot again there's a lot of uh, points that you made. I'm going to try to address some of them. The first point I would make is about agriculture and about looking at the, ac- the archaeological record, looking at bone mm. stature and mm. all that. Mm. Um, yeah, the, that's true. So when people uh, newly changed to agriculture away from being paleolithic, you look at their skeletons relatively uh, close temporarily, you know, mm. 100 years difference, whatever, or 1,000 years uh, side by side, it, it's very clear that uh, it was definitely a decline or a degeneration from the Paleolithic to agriculture. But the thing that's interesting is that over time, that improved. So heights went back up. Um, it re- it rebounded, um, you know, sure. quite markedly over time until the present day. And currently, at the present day, I think. I don't know, depending upon your estimates, we're somewhere in the ballpark of what our Paleolithic ancestors were in terms of their height. Maybe we're like an inch or two shorter or taller. It's like, right. I'm not sure. I'm, well, I'm not sure what you what you think about that, but we're not. It's not a dramatic as far as at least as far as the skeletons and the heights and, mm-hmm. the, you know, it's not a, it's not what it used to be where everybody was like five feet tall. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the reason for that is is because, you know famines happened and, and um they weren't getting enough food and they probably did have a lot of nutrient deficiencies because uh they um it's probably not a good diet it's probably a pretty terrible diet and pretty they're pretty, pretty not malnourished mm. but um i don't know if that's necessarily due to the diet itself or rather due to the circumstances around the diet namely sure. agriculture and the, the fact of famine sure so there is some evidence to suggest that, I mean, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, you know, over time, some of those issues resolved or many of those issues resolved. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing I actually wanted to touch on about short-term studies, so you mentioned the constipation or the, the bowel problem study. Yeah, yeah I do have issues uh, if I eat um, too much fiber and I'm even, and I'll just be completely transparent. Like I'm even having more issues now. And the reason is, is I just have so many calories that I'm taking in. I'm an athlete. So if I take in like a lot of calories and a lot of fiber, I'm going to run into problems. And I actually have to like, cut, I, I presume by calories, fiber. Kevin, you mean effective energy in your food because calories are heat. Right. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, energy and yeah, I mean, yes. You yes. cannot measure the energy derived from food by a human system in the form of heat. That there is no interconvertibility. Thermodynamics does not apply here. Calories Why? are heat. 
Why? 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 Well, because thermodynamics why? Why? Is, is based on an assumption of an isolated thermodynamic system, and human beings are not that. We do not sure. encapsulate and use heat to do metabolic work. The form of energy that we use to do metabolic work is chemical and not heat. Calories are, by definition and by measurement, they are heat. Yeah, but the energy contained in those bonds, we, we, uh, we do a kind of combustion, right? We take uh, carbon backbones mm -hmm. that are combustible if you set them on fire, yes. right? We add, we add oxygen to them, yes. right? We oxidize them. Yes. And then we, we, we spit out carbon dioxide. It's a lot like mm -hmm. firewood. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, okay, of course, great. Actually tell me, tell me then, Kevin, combust. how many, how many calories are contained per gram of protein? Uh, I'm sure this is a trick question. No, it's not. You know the answer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it depends upon, you know, the, I mean, I don't know what kind of, but it depends on the amino acid. I'm sure it depends on the food source, but roughly like four to 4.5 grams per, per calorie is the standard answer that. Right. And is that standard, is that standard answer correct? Does it have veracity scientifically? The answer is no. Absolutely, unequivocally, no, it does not. So wait, but why? Because of the thermogenesis? Partly or? because of that, and also partly because of the fact that very small amount of the amino acid that you take in is actually oxidized at all. Most of it is incorporated into body structures, and as such, in effect, contains no calories at all. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not, uh, I mean, yeah, sure. Um, no. Let's not get too bogged down on it. It was just a quick throw yeah, out there just to correct an yeah. incorrect statement, which is ubiquitous. I'm not point poking the finger at you particularly on this. I will correct anybody who describes the energy derivable from foods by the human system as calories because they they are not. Yeah, sure, sure. I can, I can, I can concede that definitely it, it's anywhere from a simplification to a massive oversimplification. That's just, it's just erroneous. It's just false. It's, it's completely the, the fact that the estimate of effective energy derived by using calories as a measurement of it, the error so imposed is so vast that the utility of using calories for any outcome, let's say you want to change your body composition so you control your calorie intake, you have what you, because of the error around all of that, you have to reduce your effective calorie intake so vastly to be sure that you're going to get the result that you would predict that it becomes unhealthy to do so. I I don't necessarily agree with a calorie counting perspective i think food quality is really important because you need to pay attention to your food quality or however we define food quality um in order to be properly satiated and simply like white knuckling and reducing calories is not going to work for a lot of people mm -hmm. supplementing that with an, a good understanding of nutrition science and yeah yeah. Anyway, I derailed yeah. you on the calories thing. It wasn't that important. I just yeah. wanted to correct it because it is important that people stop referring to the energy contained in food as calories. It's no such thing. Okay. That said, where you were going, it seems to me was you were saying anyway, that I'm I'm eating I'm eating a lot of food. So I I, I agree that um, fiber is not and okay, so I can see how fiber could be a problem, but that said, like I'm eating a lot of fiber. My threshold for fiber intake uh, too much. If I'm eating normally, it's like a it's over a hundred grams. Right now, it might be like closer to fifty or seventy or something. I haven't really mm -hmm. looked at the numbers, but I'm not doing well. Yeah, that's just because I'm eating so like an extremely. I'm eating a huge amount of food. So I, and I can so I can and then okay, but also I can also concede that. Um, in some populations, a lot of fiber might be really unhealthy, and some people might be do a lot better excluding some kinds of fiber. We know very clearly that some kinds of fibers, for sure, it's been scientifically or 
I don't know if it's been super well established, but it's been, I think, fairly well established. Things like FODMAPs, et cetera, some kinds of fibers can be very bad for people who have gut issues. And I think that that's also, you know, I don't think that that's, I agree on that point. That said, um, there, there have been some studies, some short-term biomarker studies where they give people supplemental fiber. It's not in a food form. And they see Im improvements to blood glucose. They see improvements to lipids, et cetera. So I wonder what you think about those data. I mean, and also improvements to like inflammatory markers. It's not necessarily like you don't see like terrible stuff happening on the short term. Right. Reductionism um, and mechanistic speculation. I'm interested in hard health outcomes over multiple decadal periods. There is no data to inform on that. Sure. There's no data. I mean, Okay, but you but you cited the constipation study. That's not yeah. And the reason I cited that is because I, that is the one and only one piece of mechanistic speculation, reductionist work that is available on this topic. Everything else you can read about the gut microbiome and fiber and everything else, all of those are review type studies, or they are studies looking at the speciation of microbiota or they are looking yeah, 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 at yeah. associations with inflammatory markers and all sorts of things like that. None of them yeah. are well controlled. None of them are well conceived. None of them are statistically powered even mostly. And the signal to noise ratio is just so vast. It's ridiculous. It's beyond a joke. Sure. I, I agree with you that there's a lot of like bullshit, especially extrapolating from mouse studies mm. and, uh, you have a review and often they won't even tell you what species that the, the study's conducted and they'll just say, oh, fi fiber, is, fiber is known to promote micro microbial diversity in the gut, which is good for health. And they'll just cite like... But, but even that assertion, even that's an assumption. Yeah, yeah. Those, yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. And then they'll cite some like mouse studies and then maybe a couple of reviews. And then you're like, you start to follow the trail and it's like not... Yeah. It's not really... Well done, and like a lot of reviews are written like this, especially by people who um, tend to stay in the lab, and they tend to write like grants and a lot of like reviews based on like animal data. They don't know how to read data properly to like properly make inferences for human beings, and so they just like they don't even know how they indiscriminately use animal and human data and all sorts of different data together to make a story, and it's yeah. bullshit. They don't understand like different places that the different kinds of data play in, in in making an argument but i will say you no know, i think there are and maybe me and you will, again we'll have to go offline and talk about this we have the the, the, the flora and fauna issue from like a hundred thousand years ago issue to talk about but i also want to point out that there are some i don't know how big they are they're not i don't think they're large but there are some randomized control trials short-term biomarkers they're not hard outcomes mm. right it's not it's not a it's not a hard health outcome, but stuff looking at like glycemia, mm. lipids, mm. inflammatory markers, not yeah. an association study. And I know there's tons of association studies like looking at the association between fiber and taking according to dietary questionnaire and like yeah. inflammatory markers. But I think there's actually clinical trials themselves mm. and like a dozen of them. Yeah. Some of them are probably shitty. Probably a lot of them are bad. Yeah. And there's you know, I'd be interested in, in looking at those with you because I'm not I don't know the quality of them. Let's uh, maybe look at them after this is over. I'm not going to go live and die on that hill, but I mm. will point out that there are, I don't know if you've looked at them and, and maybe, yep, maybe I have. you found them, lacking, but we can talk, we can talk about it. Sure. Uh, yeah. I, so, so um, Jesus Christ, we, we, uh, there's a lot uh, of other stuff you said. So um, yeah. Okay. So then let me pose a question to you about, uh, you're probably just going to think this is ridiculous. Uh, but what about um, LDL cholesterol? Yep. And uh, and so one thing I think is well established, and you can correct me if you think mm -hmm. it's wrong, is that low fiber diets uh, tend to have higher LDL cholesterol. It's, that may be because of um, like refined carbohydrates. I'm not sure what your position is on that mm -hmm. um and then high, diets that are higher in saturated fat tend to also increase ldl cholesterol although there's now a substantial amount of controversy about that plant-based diets tend to reduce ldl cholesterol mm -hmm. right 
Um, what do you think about the impact of, say, a hypercarnivorous diet on people who are susceptible to increases in LDL cholesterol on such a diet? Do you think that that represents a potential health okay. um, yeah. right. risk to them? Right. Yeah. Number one, there is no such thing as LDL cholesterol. <laughs> it does not exist. LDL is a lipoprotein carrier of cholesterol. Cholesterol comes in one and only one form in the human body, and it doesn't come in good forms and in bad forms. The lipoprotein carriers of cholesterol all exist because they are encoded for by a length of DNA, that length of DNA having survived 13,800 million years of both positive and negative selection pressures at least. They all have a role to play in the body. They all have a purpose. None of them are bad and none of them are pathogenic. There is no such thing as atherogenic lipoproteins. Absolute nonsense. Never was, never will be. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by susceptible to increased LDL cholesterol because, number one, it doesn't exist, and number two, it doesn't cause heart disease at all. Well, what do you think about the clinical trials using drugs producing LDL cholesterol and the impact on the long-term? Okay, uh, so the, the impacts, again, impact is a cause and effect inference. You cannot make that from an associative study. There are clinical trials. That makes no difference to the fact that they are not actually controlled experiments. They are people who are given a certain drug and then they check that that drug has had the effect on the marker that they're looking at, in this case, LDL. And they also associate the incidence of heart disease diagnoses in that population. And they then say, now we have an association between reduced LDL and reduced heart disease incidence. That is not an experimental study. That's an associative naturalistic observation. It's not well controlled. There are so many confounds, it's ridiculous. Um, the actual differences in absolute terms between the highest and lowest LDL cholesterol and heart disease uh, do not actually even imply that there is a dose response relationship between LDL and heart disease anyway. The single largest uh, data set available on this topic is not even published in the peer-reviewed literature. It's two data sets collected independently by two so-called respectable organizations, one of whom being the British Heart Foundation and the other one being the World Health Organization. They have a data set on serum cholesterol and obviously the subcomponents of the cholesterol in well over a thousand million individuals from 148 countries and territories around the world. And their data set says that associatively, the lowest incidence of all causes of, motel of mortality as well as every subcause, heart disease included, as one of those, every single one of those goes up precipitously as the cholesterol, the serum cholesterol, is reduced below 220 milligrams per deciliter total cholesterol, which would suggest that the optimum, associatively, the optimum LDL proportion of that is going to be somewhere around about probably 100, 110 on average, in fact, associatively. Um, I have, I don't know how many videos I've made debunking this absolute ridiculous nonsensical garbage that people are pointing the finger at cholesterol or lipoprotein of any kind or any subfraction of lipoprotein as being remotely causal in heart disease, whatever. It does not hold any water. It does not work. It is not acceptable science. It is bought and paid for. It is um, ideological. It is smoke and mirrors. It is propagandist nonsense of the highest order. It's also well to understand that statin medications, which are usually the 
form of pharmacology used to reduce LDL cholesterol in a given population, those statins have a serendipitous anti-inflammatory effect that was never planned as part of their pharmacology. It was never the goal of the thing. The goal of the thing was to reduce LDL cholesterol, erroneously, because it's not the cause of a problem in the first place. However, what has been found is that in a population of men, and only in men, and only in men over 65, not men under 65, that there is a meaningful uh, clinically important reduction in the incidence of secondary cardiovascular disease outcomes, not primary. So in other words, if you're a man over 65 and you have already had a heart attack, then anti-inflammatory treatment is indicated for you. But I would still do that in the form of an anti-inflammatory that's not a statin, because statins are a dangerous contraindicated metabolic poison that no human being should touch with a barge pole under any circumstances. That is what the science is on um, cholesterol, heart disease, um, and I speak with my cardiovascular pathophysiologist's hat on for that last spiel because that's one of three specializations that I have advanced research degrees in. Cardiovascular pathophysiology, the physiology of rest and exercise, and pure and applied statistical inference, if anybody wants to know what my particular um, research degrees are in. That's what, that's what they are. So, um, cholesterol, no. Not a cause of a problem. Not something that needs to be lowered, not something you should lower. It seems to be contraindicated to lower it. If anything, it's under the control of your genes. Leave your genes to it. Your genes know what they're doing. Okay. Um, I think this is one, probably one topic. I don't think I've had any, sh just because I think that the evidence so far, everything we've been talking about, uh, in my opinion, is is pretty fuzzy all this a lot of the stuff is pretty fuzzy there's different arguments that we can have about mm. different topics but on the the topic of ldl cholesterol and cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease risk i'm probably gonna have to disagree pretty strongly probably as strongly as you're disagreeing with me well you'll be wrong <laughs> you will be wrong kevin because there is no evidence <laughs> of a cause and effect nature linking LDL cholesterol, which does not exist with heart disease. So this is not a debate you can win, Kevin. You will lose <laughs> on this one. So, <laughs> so um, I think the studies that strongly establish, in my opinion, the causal relationship between LDL cholesterol. No, I'm going to have to stop you there, Kevin. No, I will not accept that. That is not acceptable. <laughs> there is no causal relationship established anywhere in the literature between non-existent LDL cholesterol and heart disease. <clears throat> Just saying that there is and that your opinion that there is will not do. There is no evidence to support that claim. I think there's really, really strong randomized control trial well you're wrong there is not sorry and 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 i don't think that um it's it i think it's dependent on ldl cholesterol lowering not on the anti-inflammatory effects of statins which do exist no that's false I, given I, I, for again let me remind you again ldl cholesterol does not exist son So what is LDL cholesterol then? It's simply a fraction when you spin down the, the uh, I, I've never done the, the lipid columns, but you spin it down. Okay, so what, what you're fraction, telling me here, Kevin, is that you've never been involved in clinically looking at this area whatsoever, and you want to debate with me about whether or not there is good clinical evidence of cause and effect here. Do you see how ridiculous and ludicrous that is? I have spent more than a quarter of a century as a cardiovascular pathophysiologist. Could you be wrong? On this topic, no. I've checked it out so carefully, so thoroughly, and I have stood up against high-level 
professors in this field who have an axe to grind and who have a research funding source to protect from a pharmaceutical companies, I have had to defend this hill against all comers for a very, very long time. And I can assure you, I am not remotely wrong on this. Let me answer your question. Cholesterol comes in one and only one form in the human body. You can look in any textbook you like and you will find the molecule, which is cholesterol, shown to you there. It doesn't come in a good form and in a bad form. Cholesterol being a lipid cannot dissolve in the plasma portion of the blood because the plasma portion of the blood is aqueous and as such a lipid won't dissolve in that. As such it requires a carrier. There are various different classes of carrier and these are phospholipoproteins which encapsulate the lipids including cholesterol so that they can be um, travel around the body in the blood basically so they will dissolve in the blood plasma. All of those phospholipoproteins are different classes of um, carrier. The thing that determines the difference between one class and another is the particular protein involved in the phospholipid bilayer package, the thing that identifies it. LDL is a class of lipoproteins that are flagged, if you like, or identified by the ApoB100 protein. The role of the low-density lipoprotein is to deliver molecular cholesterol and other lipids directly to the vascular epithelial bed, where it can be absorbed into the cells and used for metabolic process. When someone gives you an LDL reading from your blood, they are asserting that that's the proportion of the cholesterol, all of the cholesterol, because it's all identical. They're saying that's the proportion of cholesterol carried by the lipoprotein, the low density lipoprotein, as opposed to, for example, the higher density lipoprotein. And as such, we are being told that. Cholesterol being carried by LDL is bad somehow, where the exact same identical cholesterol being carried by HDL is good. That is fundamentally right. ridiculous. They are identical molecules. They are both cholesterol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we we mostly agree on everything up to that point. I don't know if I necessarily agree that LDL cholesterol is being taken up into endothelium to be used uh, for metabolic process, although it is to some degree actually taken up by the endothelium uh, to be used, but it's not, I don't know if that's the main role of LDL cholesterol, but I think the bigger, the bigger disagreement here is, or the bigger, I don't know, maybe difference is that it's yeah. I, I actually I agree that it's not the cholesterol itself, although some degree maybe, but it's mostly not the cholesterol itself in LDL cholesterol that's path like pathogenic. It's not causing cardiovascular. It is the the ApoB, the apolipoprotein B associated with that cholesterol that is pathogenic. No, it that isn't, Kevin. No, wrong again. No, it is not pathogenic. It exists. Because it is encoded for by a length of DNA that has survived 13,800 million years. ApoB I mean, in the native form that as produced by the human body is not pathogenic. No. Sir, sir however, uh, glucose is also produced by the body. Inflammatory markers are produced by the body. They can cause, uh, they can cause pathology, right? Things that are produced by the body can cause pathology. Or can be involved in the in the in in pathological processes. They can be, right? but ApoB one hundred is not one of those. I don't agree. So what I'm on what I'm basis saying, do you disagree with that? Do you have any experimental evidence that ApoB one hundred is pathogenic in human beings at all? I think um, we can talk about it here. We can talk about it offline, but I'll I'll tell you what it is because I, I don't want to get too much into the uh into the mud if you don't want to do that but i can 
uh, I think we have like knock straight out of the ballpark, like completely um, like as definitive as you can get in the context of, of medicine, of modern medicine, randomized control trials demonstrating it. I do believe that. Well, um, you've been hit, Kevin. You've been fooled yeah. because those studies do not exist. One of us has been a cardiovascular pathophysiologist for more than a quarter of a century, Kevin, and the other one is you. Yeah, but then there's also morons uh, like Fauci. Fauci. Like, there's morons like Fauci in the world who have been uh, uh, vaccinologists or, or immunologists or, or infectious disease experts. He's not a dumb person. He's actually not a dumb person, right? Fauci's not a dumb person, but he can still be wrong about things, right? Sure. Fauci is actually probably a, a, an extremely talented, extremely gifted individual who has been wrong and has done a lot of things wrong over the last couple of years. He's I an evil that, piece of shit, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about I, whether there I, are any studies yeah, extant I, that show pathogenesis from APOB 100. And Kevin, there are no such studies. I, all I'm saying is that people who are extremely intelligent, who have studied issues for a long time, can still be wrong. Right. And, that is uh, true. Absolutely. But as, as regards whether or not there are any studies that exist which establish cause and effect pathogenesis from ApoB100 protein in human beings, the answer, Kevin, irrespective of who you are, is that no such studies exist. Let's talk about it all, offline because I think that there's really good studies. There aren't, Kevin. Uh, there are no good studies. Yell, yell what I, I'm giving you, an abs I'm, I'm giving you an absolutely unequivocal statement of fact. So please listen to the wording I'm using very carefully because it is important. I'm giving you a fact. It is not an opinion. The fact is there are no studies extant which establish pathogenesis in human beings from ApoB100 protein. They do we not disagree exist. disagree about the facts. We disagree about the facts. Well, as we I say, one, one of us has been studying this field for more than 25 years, Kevin, and the other one is you. you could, yeah, but that doesn't mean that you're right. Well, I am right, though, Kevin. I am absolutely correct on this. I have had to defend this hill for a very long time. Do you want to move on to the next topic? Sure. Y yes? Sure, absolutely. Okay, yeah. okay, good. Because I thought we were going to, like, some, somebody was going <laughs> to... I thought you were mad at me. I'm not so, mad at you um, at all, Kevin. I'm just being absolutely unequivocal <laughs> with the facts, because I know what they are. Yeah, let, let's talk about it offline because I think that uh, I'll I'm, I'll link you a study. I want you to I want to hear what you have, what you think about it. Send me yeah. one and I'll make a video on what's wrong with it. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, and we can well, even do it together if you want. I can do it myself, or well, we can do it together. It's fine either way. Well, let let me ask you this, Bart. Yeah. Because I think it's 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 important. Um, is it like to me? This is to me. My definition of a scientist, maybe mm -hmm. yours is different, mm -hmm. but like what makes a scientist, in my opinion, the mm -hmm. core thing that makes a scientist, the scientist, the thing that allows the scientist to, to, to try to rule out his or her own biases. Of course, yeah. the scientific method is really important. Experiment, well control experiment, super important. But I also yeah. think that there's a certain mentality yes. um, of wanting to prove yourself wrong. Yes. Would you agree that that is 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 super important for for being a scientist? It's your absolute responsibility to do absolutely everything possible in your power to prove yourself wrong. So all I'm asking, with in this respect, whenever I, we talk about this offline, mm. uh, all I'm asking is for you to try to take that attitude to this topic whenever I send that to you. And I absolutely will, because I absolutely have already done this work, Kevin. Very, very carefully, there is no evidence of pathogenesis as that relates to ApoB100 protein or any other aspect of the lipoproteins at all. It does not exist. You can, you can cite me any number of studies you like, and I will point straight to what is wrong with those studies because I've probably already read them very, very carefully. Let's while ever, right while ever it is your responsibility to try and prove yourself wrong as a scientist, what you also have to do as a scientist is apply appropriate 
scientific discipline. And one of the things around scientific discipline is using the correct set of rules required to establish what is and what is not proof. Yeah, I think maybe we have a deeper disagreement about what science is, so I don't know if I can necessarily prove anything. I don't try to... Ah, that's funny, though. I was, I was saying... But see, see, I don't think we can necessarily prove anything. I, mm-hmm. I think that we can come close, close to it. Um, I think, I think it's legitimate for you to say that there's no, I don't think it's true, but I think it's like a legitimate move to, for you to make to say that, um, there's no studies, et cetera, that like, you can say that, but, um, I don't think like you can say there's no evidence. I think there, that, that that's another move, but I don't think you can say that it's like something is or like or definitely. I don't think you can prove a negative, right? <laughs> no, no, you can't prove a negative necessarily any more than you can prove a positive claim. Scientists rely on inference. However, if you want to be taken seriously and respected as a scientist. You have to be prepared to apply the appropriate level of discipline to what you will personally accept as a reasonable inference of anything. Yeah. And maybe as you, you're very young in terms of as a scientist, Kevin, I know you're not necessarily a young man, but as a scientist, you're very young in that regard, and you probably haven't actually been through the rigmarole of all of this quite yet. You will learn as you develop as a scientist throughout your career as such that if you leave any chink in your armor, somebody will take advantage of that and will stick a knife in there. I have spent a number of decades refining my armor to the point where I am unassailable. And it's because I choose my words so very carefully and I am so very disciplined about what science is and is not and can and cannot inform upon. And I thus formulate statements that are unassailable. That's the, that's the reason I do it, so that I am unassailable. I, I, I try to do the same thing. But I also realize that I've been wrong so many times in my life that I don't try to personally, I try to um, try to always be open to, to being wrong because I, I often am. So I, I thought I was wrong once, but it seems I was mistaken on that. <laughs> very, very good. All right. Um, do you want to wrap it up on that, or do you do you want to cover anything else? Oh, look, I'm I'm, I'm perfectly relaxed. I've got half an hour until my next thing. We can wind up here, and if you want to do round three, I'm absolutely open to that. Please don't take my firm tone and my unequivocality as at all any sign of anger. I'm not remotely angry or pissed off in any way. I'm just <laughs> there are certain there are certain lines in the sand that I will not allow anybody to cross. And I will correct them every time, and I will not let it go, and I will be very dogmatic on that. It's probably part of my autism spectrum presentation, if nothing else. Um, it can be it can be uncomfortable for others at, from time to time. I understand that, uh, but also at the end of the day, uh, people need to stop being wrong. <laughs> well, um, you and me both, with respect to the autism spectrum presentation, but. I'm always working at my best to try to uh, mitigate the degree to which I'm uncomfortable to other people. Hmm. So, um, yeah. Whereas I take the approach of saying, actually, this is for clicks, <laughs> and you know, if I get under somebody's skin and they get pissed off with me, well, that's that's on them. At the end of the day, if I get pissed off, and I have in the past got pissed off with others and let my temper get away on me, and while I remained unassailable, because that's how I define my very existence as a scientist, people tend to, to view that as some kind of weakness, some kind of loss. They go, oh, well, maybe he was right, but he lost his temper, and so therefore he was still wrong. So these days, rather than lose my temper, I just state 
what is correct unequivocally, and I repeat it if I have to. And if somebody tries to repeat that error again, I will stop them again and correct them again. And if that means that the conversation goes no further at that point, so be it. I mean, examples of that are when you say calories, I say, no, Kevin, that's heat. When you say LDL is causally involved in heart disease, I will say, no, Kevin, it is not. Absolutely not. No. And if we, if that's, want, if we get stuck in the mud on that, then so be it. But those are still the facts. Do you want, do you want to stop the recording and, and talk off, uh, off the record? Oh, we absolutely can, if you think there's any value in that. Um, as I say, I've got about Maybe. half an hour. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. I will stop the recording now. Three, anyway, before I do that, let's say thank you to everybody viewing. Thank you, everybody, for viewing. Hope you got something out of it. Um, and, and, and thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Bart. No, my pleasure. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm just pleased to be able to have an even remotely somewhere close to reasonable <laughs> conversation with somebody who doesn't necessarily agree that the carnivore diet is the right approach. Because most people who think it isn't are usually vegetated vagoons from the Church of Anorexia Vegana who are unable to identify the difference between their elbow and their asshole if you label both of those and teach them to read, in fact. So we're glad to I have somebody disagree. with an intellect. Mm. I, I won't disagree with you about that. <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you, everybody. We'll stop the recording and we'll have a debrief afterwards. Just keep an eye. All right. See you then. Uh, whoops.